Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Listen, the next few weeks we're going to take some of uh, Hollywood's best films and we're going to take some of the uh, illustrative um, ideas that honestly they didn't come up with. If you look at Hollywood today, I can literally quote a Bible verse for every single message that they try to bring across, whether it's good or evil. And how many know that God doesn't hold back any punch? Look at Matthew 13. Let me just kind of explain this to you. Matthew 13. Guys, come on, help me out. Matthew 13. We're going to get it right now, media. Let's pray for them. Father, help them. Matthew 13, verse 34 says this. Jesus always used stories and illustrations like what? These, when speaking to the crowds, in fact, he never spoke to them without using such parables. You have to understand that you and I, we have the most incredible message in our hands called the Holy Bible. And one thing about Jesus that we have to understand is that Hollywood, it wasn't their big idea to be the greatest storyteller on the earth. It was God's great idea to be the first one to do it. And every time that he preached, he always painted a picture. For example, when he wanted to talk about faith, he would grab a child, put the child on his lap. He says, faith is like a child. And, and so I love the fact that we can take something that Hollywood did in the film industry and we can baptize it and use it for God's glory. Amen? And bring it back to the, to the scriptures. And as we see this film of Jurassic Park, how many like Jurassic Park? It's a great, 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 great film. Um, you know, Dr. Grant was a very passionate, um, you know, guy. He really had uh, a lot of faith and, and belief in his work, in his, the I'm just going to call it his theology, um, so much that he was irritated and bothered when someone uh, couldn't accept the fact that there were dinosaurs on the earth. You saw the little kid, right, that starts challenging him whether or not that whole uh, velociraptor was like legit real. He called it, that's ah, just a big old turkey. And uh, the moment he heard that, man, Dr. Grant was not happy with hearing that. He wasn't happy at all, and it really just did something inside of him. And instead of him wanting to explain it with love and with compassion, oh, no, man, he was just, like, not having it. And he begins to express and even illustrate what a velociraptor would do to you if you were ever to be in the presence of one of those type of dinosaurs. He gets so expressive and so excited about it that even... He brings out that little claw that we saw, and he says, and this is how he'll slice you up, and uh-uh. And he's just, and the kid's just like listening to this, that he ends up becoming a believer, right? Well, you know, like so many of us, you know, we have this wonderful thing, this beautiful salvation called faith. We have our theology. We have the word of God, and we believe in it so much, hopefully. And we're passionate about it, hopefully. And we're excited about it. Not only excited about the gospel, but excited about what Jesus did with our life. And therefore, we have a story to tell the world. But so many times, as a Christian, you can become so saved that you start having organized Christianity. In other words, your salvation is so organized that you do not like anyone to get in the way or even the path of your walk or your theology or your constant discovery of God. I mean, it's so easy as a Christian to get so comfortable in the church that we no longer are willing or even ready to look for anyone outside who is also in a lost world, right? This is our Jurassic Park world. It's right outside these, these double doors when you walk out of Elevate Church every single weekend. Well, guess what? Eventually, Dr. Grant began to get softened, and eventually we see that he rests excuse the little rugrats that he didn't like, right? He didn't like kids. He said they're noisy, they're, they cost a lot, they're smelly. Well, let me tell you, winning souls will cost you everything. Winning souls will make you very uncomfortable. Winning people to Christ is going to make you sometimes feel like, man, I don't even know if I have the time for this. And that is a dangerous place to be. But the truth and the reality is, is that you live in a lost world. You live in a Jurassic world. And that world is in your workplace, in your community, anywhere and everywhere you go. And so I want to just kind of tie this, this message into, you know what, how far are you willing to go for Jesus? How far are you willing to go for Jesus? This Dr. Grant was 
willing to go as far as he could to rescue these kids that he really didn't want anything to do with. And I get it. In this world, there's some ugly people. Man, there's some people you don't want to be around. You and I sometimes can be in a place prior to being in ministry. Man, I had bosses. I had people in management that I was re responsible or that were responsible over me. And, man, I'll tell you, some of them were just the most rudest, meanest, just evil people, honestly. But just because of that attitude or that mindset, that didn't give me a, a, a ticket or a pass to be exempted from reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have the greatest message that can literally change people's life, not only rescue them, but transform them. And we get to carry, we have the privilege to carry that. But are you excited about it? Are you still passionate about the story that God gave you? Or have you just become so organized in your salvation that you just don't want to even be bothered by anybody? Are you hearing me today? Now, listen, the message is going to get nice and it's going to get good. We're going to have to lock these doors in a little bit too, watch. But I promise you that you will be encouraged and blessed by this message today. But here's the truth. We know that the best story that we have is Jesus, right? We know that um, for God so loved the world that he sent his only son, Jesus, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And so he sends Jesus. And we know the purpose of Jesus was to save us from ourselves and from Satan, who is the author of all sin and and sin is what was separating humanity from God. And God said, I need to have an eternal plan for uh, my children. And so Jesus, he comes on earth. And in three and a half years, he does all kinds of wonderful miracle signs and wonders. And, and not only that, but he gives himself for our salvation. And so we know his story. He's, he's put on a cross. Then he's buried in a tomb. Think about this. Then he's buried in the tomb. Do you see how God was creating the most amazing Hollywood story that ever exists? He's buried in a tomb. And, and, and the religious people, the organized religious people that wanted nothing beyond what Jesus did in those three and a half years, were trying to bury the truth inside of a tomb and sealing it so that no one would ever never find that truth again but we know that God always has another plan God always has a strategy God always has an exit in every and any situation you find yourself in and we know that he raised Christ Jesus from the dead and you know what there was two guys that obviously loved him there was three guys that loved him Peter James and John well when they heard and discovered that Jesus was raised from the dead they said, I got to go see it for myself. Now, the only reason that they wanted to go see it for themselves was because Mary and Martha had already been the first ones to realize that the tomb was empty. Even the angels said, what you girls doing here? He ain't here. He's out. He's gone. And they ran back into the room and to the, the disciples. And then Peter and John started running to the tomb. I mean, they were just like going on a race. But John, the Bible says that John outran Peter and look at the picture this was the first discovery man John's looking at 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 where Jesus lay and he's like OMG literally OMG he's no longer there can you imagine what type of testimony these men carried after this obviously we know because you and I are sitting here today because of men and women like them who kept taking a 2,000 year message that we are still receiving today and let me tell you something it is not dead it is not buried it is more alive than the very chair you're sitting on right now amen, amen? amen. come on give the Lord a hand clap for that story what an amazing story I mean, hopefully, you still have a shock in your eyes. You still have the awe of God in your life where you say, wow, God saved me. God delivered me. God set me free. Or you're so saved now, you're so organized in your Christianity that you forgot everything God did for you. And you become like Dr. Grant. He's so consumed with his theology. Come on, as, as, as Christians, we can be so consumed with our programs EMG, Elevate Marriage Groups, yay, right? We have uh, Elevate Family Night once a month. And listen, last Wednesday was packed. It was amazing. We had a phenomenal time, yay, right? We have small groups, yay. We have every single group. We have everything that feeds us leadership meetings, everything. And we're just like, yay, and we just suck it up and we eat it all up. And that's, listen, those are all great things. But your salvation did not end with a program 
the destination of your salvation did not end when you lifted your hand and said, I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Come on, your salvation destination did not end when you actually did the prayer and said, Jesus, I receive you in my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. And for so many Christians in 2018, the salvation has ended with a prayer and that was it. That is not the end of your destination. You still have a journey ahead of you. Well, how many know that in Jurassic Park, man, they've had a journey. I think, what is it, Jurassic Park number four by now? What is it? They're still going, right? Well, guess what? That's just the movie. But you're living God's dream. You're living God's story right now. But the question is, is are you so consumed with yourself that you no longer have a passion or even an excitement to actually go out and reach hurting and broken people and letting them know what God, can you even explain Jesus to people nowadays? Can you actually come and be illustrative and be passionate about it and talk about how not only Jesus saved you, but do you even know scripture to be able to break it down and give people an interpretation, a revelation of one verse that they can hug on, that they can cover them themselves with because how many know that the word of God is a comforter right the Holy Spirit is the comforter there is scripture that we can bring to people that are in a very dark hurting place and one word from heaven can change their situation do you have that type of that that type of uh, sustainability where you can carry God's word like that do you even care about God's word like that anymore because Jesus didn't die for you and I to be safe we live in a Jurassic Park world we live in a lost world. And we can have an attitude. That's what happens. I think that most Christians in America, we kind of just think, well, let's just go to church. Let's just go see God on Sunday. And we give them our Sunday. But don't touch our Monday through Saturday. See, because Monday, don't you dare touch my attitude. Don't touch my money. Don't touch my life. Don't touch my habits. Don't touch my sins. And so we'll go ahead and we'll give him Sunday, kind of, because the average Christian nowadays only goes to church once or twice a, a month now. That's the average attendance of a Christian. We're talking about those who call themselves followers of Jesus. Once or twice a month now is the average attendance of Christians. If you're sitting here and you're one of them, have no fear, have no shame. Today you can change. Amen? I told you it's going to get sticky. <laughs> now, I get it. When you think about, like, um, Jurassic Park, I was thinking about just the way these dinosaurs all throughout the movie, they're always eating up people. Now, please don't send me an email if you got upset and offended because I showed the part where the T-Rex eats the dude on the toilet, all right? You watch way more crazier, evil, wicked things. So if you email me, I'm going to delete it. So don't send it to me. But we know that we know that in that world, they they were all these 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 uh, velociraptors, these T Rexes, and and all the, they, they're meat eaters, man. They're just tearing it up, killing. I get it. In this world, sometimes people will eat you up, man. They'll bite you. You're trying to just do good, and they'll just like ah, and they'll just go off on you. And I get it. It's a turnoff sometimes. After all, just like man, people they suck. Go to hell, right? That's what you really want to tell people sometimes, right? Yeah, just go to hell, man. Yeah, you deserve you. De Funny story, but it's true. This is true, okay? I'm not making this up. Um, any vegans in here today? Any vegans? Anyone here claim you're vegan? One person? Okay, we're going to pray for you after service. We're going to get you free. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's awesome. I love that you're a vegan. But then you would probably know this story if you're a vegan, okay? But this, this, this group of people um, claim to be vegans, but they wanted to adjust their veganism. And so they called it the new vegans. And mind you, this was like an association type of deal. And so a lot of people started getting on the bandwagon of the new theology. It's the new vegan diet. And so the new vegan diet basically is this, is um, they eat a vegan lifestyle, but when they're really hungry, they'll eat meat, chicken, fish, tacos, whatever. <laughs> when they're really hungry. Now, most often, they'll only do that like maybe once or twice a week where they'll actually eat meat. But if you were to talk to them, they would say, I'm vegan. Well, the OG vegan people, the originators of vegan, were like, 
hell to the no, you're not going to call yourself the new vegans. You better change your name because guess what? You're not the real deal. If you're a vegan, you have to live like a vegan. Come on. You have to eat like a vegan. You can't begin to say that you're a vegan, but you're not. You're eating meat. Are you crazy? And so the association, because the vegans came against the new vegans, the new vegans had to get together and said, shoot, what do we call ourselves? They did. Look it up. You think I'm lying. I'm not lying to you. And so they came in a board meeting, and they finally decided to call themselves the Flexitarians. <laughs> the Flexit, that's what they called. So now there's a diet called the Flexitarians. That means that basically, let's say, let's say that gentleman in the back that's a vegan, I, I went to his house. Obviously, I'm going to eat um, everything he eats as a vegan, right? But let's say I go to Carlos's house, which I know this is a steak and potato guy. <laughs> and I was the flexitarian. Well, I would sit there and I'd be like, oh, well, he's serving steak. Might as well eat it. Right? Why? I'm a flexitarian. I'm flexible. If you got, if you got vegetables, I'll tear it up. If you got fish, I'll eat it. If you got chicken, I'll eat it. If you got tacos, I'll eat it. If you got carne asada, I'll eat it. If you got a tamale with pork in it, I'll eat it. I'm a flexitarian. Google it. It exists. <laughs> Why am I saying this? Because the church has become flexitarians. The church is so amazing at being a flexitarian. We are so flexible when it comes to eating God's word. We will literally pick and choose what scripture we're going to keep. We're the greatest flexitarians. The church of 2018, the church, I'm talking about Elevate Church and every single church in America is a flexitarian church. It is so difficult to get everybody on the same page. As a matter of fact, normally in messages and churches, you probably have like maybe a third or maybe less of the crowd that will actually accept what's being said on a Sunday. Because there's a flexitarian. You, you, you choose which scripture you want to keep. The flexitarian will also choose which scripture they're going to follow. Right? Because there's some, sometimes you read scripture and we, we hear healing and we're like, yes, healing. <laughs> but then it comes to, hey, let's receive the tithes and offerings. Like, hmm, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Don't talk about money in church because, wow, people get uncomfortable. It's flex, flexitarian. Talk about forgiveness. Like, okay, let's not go there. Okay. And we'll even say like, okay, you, you <laughs> okay, that's a trigger. <laughs> Don't talk about forgiveness. That's a trigger for me right now. I can't handle that right now. Okay, I get it. I get it. But, but, but you're either going to accept the whole council or you're going to be flexitarian. Doesn't that sound like a dinosaur too? It's the flexitarian, right? <laughs> Everybody say flexitarian. flexitarian. And so the vegans are like, you're not going to proclaim to be something you're not. You're not even going to begin to think that you're going to be associated with something that we live and we're faithful and committed to. Have you noticed that today in, in, in Christianity, less and less Christians are committed to follow Jesus Christ. Less and less. And you'll, you'll understand when I'm finished with this message what I mean by less committed. They're less faithful, less committed, less loyal, less convicted, less willing to change, less willing to obey. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a culture now of flexitarians in the church that are less than what God wants for you. But we can change that. So this is not a message of, of, of condemnation. This is a message to get us to go from flexitarians to being followers of Jesus Christ. My question for you today is how far are you willing to go in following Jesus? I'm not talking about being a fan because we got a lot of fans of what we do here at Elevate Church. Like we talk about rescuing children, and people are a fan on that. But I'm not asking you to be a fan. I'm asking you to be a follower of Jesus. People are fans of all the different ministries we have. Oh, I have we have Reveal Nights. Yay, I'm a fan. Okay, that's awesome. Great. I love Reveal. Awesome. I love EMG. Yay. I love our leadership teaching we do now with men. I love all these different programs we have. But are you living for the program, or are you living to follow him? Who are you living for? Because God already has a diet that he picked. And that word, here's what Jesus said. For I do not live by bread alone, 
but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Do you live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God? Or do you just pick and choose which one you'll keep and which one you choose to follow? I know this is a strong message, but this is a message for all of us. This is the message for the church. This is the message for you watching online. This is the message for every single one of us, including myself. Can I get a big amen? Amen. So don't be the person that says, you got my Sunday, God, but Monday it's my time, it's my money, it's my life, it's my attitude, it's my habits, it's my sin, it's my da. That's not the life that God chose for us. You can't just pick and choose what you want to follow. You got to go ahead and choose Jesus. Look at this quickly. Because everyone wants to follow Jesus until he requires something of us, right? John 6, 60 through 61. So let me just kind of paint the picture. So in, in John 5, Jesus just finished feeding the 5,000. You guys know that story? Remember he turns two fish and five loaves into uh, a whole lot of food. And he feeds 5,000. That's just men, not including women, children. So I think the actual number is over 10,000 people. And so they just had like a food fest. And so, man, all these people are like, yay, we got food. I mean, when God blesses, he blesses with leftover. See, when you choose to follow Jesus, he not only gives you what you currently need, he'll give you beyond that so you can have some leftover for the next day and the next day and the next. So, so Jesus had a lot of, lot of, not followers, a lot of fans. Free meal ticket. Yay, yay, let's go. Let's keep going with him. Now we're in chapter 6. We're in chapter 6. Chapter 5. <sighs> you fed me. I was so, that was an awesome message. Dang, I was so good. Like the popcorn right now you just ate. I was free 99. It cost you anything, right? Man, that was an awesome church. Why? The popcorn was amazing. It was free. The people were following him because they were getting things that were free. But then we get to John 6 and we have a problem. This is where you have to examine yourself. This is where you begin to check yourself. You check yourself before you wreck yourself. In John 6, in verse 60, it says, and look at this, on hearing it, so he's preaching another message now. He's bringing another sermon. He's bringing some more understanding, more revelation. And it says, and on hearing it, it says, uh, did it say some, a few? How many? How, how many is many? That's a lot. That's a whole lot of many. There's so many that we can't even get a number for it. And so many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Dang, pastor, why do you have to go there, dude? Like, why couldn't you just leave it at the movies? <laughs> this is a hard teaching. Who can accept this? Who can even take the word of God and actually, who can even live this? Who can accept? I mean, when you are in a very lost place, even as a Christian, it is even hard for you and I to accept the truth. You see, it wasn't that the message was hard. It's that the message came with truth and today in America people hate truth they don't like truth you and I sometimes okay let's I mean Mauricio is included in this we don't like to hear the truth because the truth will confront your stuff the truth will confront your comfort the truth will confront the sins that you and I sometimes still have, a sin can be a one bad attitude. You constantly have a bad attitude at your workplace. That's a sin. You know what God does? On a Sunday you come and we preach a message on love. And you're like, dang, what do you have to do with that? You know, and forgiveness. And, and you start hearing these messages. Well, guess what? The church of Jesus, he was preaching this amazing killer message. And then people were like, oh, yeah, I don't know if we can. Yeah, I don't like, yeah, I don't like that. Uh, can people even accept that? Like, is it, man, people are going to leave this church. They're not going to like to hear that kind of preaching in this place. Why does he have to go there? Why can't he just play another movie? Why can't he just do Incredibles? <laughs> but check this out. Verse 61. Aware that his disciples, let me say aware. Listen, Jesus is aware of your attitude already. Jesus is aware of your sin, my sin. He's aware of your lust and your love. He's aware. Don't hate. Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, I'm sorry, uh, does this offend you? Uh, my, my bad. <laughs> Come here, guys. And we're talking thousands, right? Many, right? He just fed 
over 10,000. So just ima imagine how many of them he was talking to. Uh, I'm sorry. I, did, I, I was aware of your grumbling. Um, did, did, I, did I offend you in any way? Did this hurt you? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just telling you the truth. Did the truth bother you? I mean, are you asking me to bend it so that it, it, it adjusts to your lifestyle? I'm sorry. What, what, are you, what, are, what are you guys saying? And, and, and he's like, he's in a place where Jesus has to make a decision. And let me tell you something. I know that, thank God, that Jesus is not uncomfortable when people are in a place of flexitarian. Right? And look, and he was basically telling him, is my message boring, you guys? Verse 66 of the same chapter. And after he said, am I offending you? From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer what? Listen, you don't have to. Let me say it this way better. You don't need to be in the church building to have left him. You can be in this building right now and have already left him. What do I mean by that? We leave his word. His word, his truth. And, and we adopt and we come up with our own theology, our, our own ways, our own attitudes. And then we have our own kind of salvation that we've tweaked so that it, it, it adjusts to my way of doing things my way of thinking and then we think that we're living for him but the reality is that we've already walked away from his truth because we've come up with our own little things we why i don't want to be uncomfortable following jesus you see jesus was saying uh do we have an issue with this sacrifice sacrificial following that i'm requiring of you see our following is not for us to be safe and comfortable our following is to always be uncomfortable you should if your salvation is not uncomfortable then you're you you and i we're in trouble if we're not uncomfortable i mean the jesus you follow does does he require you comfort does he require of you uh uh, uh pain-free situations because the jesus i follow requires being uncomfortable uh, uh, costing me everything constantly uh, always asking me to do something that i really don't want to do uh, always require me to forgive people i don't want to forgive he's that's the jesus i follow and, and so if the one you're following right now is not uh, making you feel a little bit uncomfortable then you're following a different kind of jesus Hey, I can give one thing for Dr. Grant. At least he was passionate about what he believed in. His issue was people. Are you with me? He said, and from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. And so many was not a few. Many was not a dozen. Many was a whole lot of people. And the Bible doesn't say where those many went. But let me tell you something. But it definitely doesn't say that Jesus chased after them. He wasn't chasing after anybody. Aren't you glad that we have a God that doesn't manipulate you, that doesn't, that doesn't micromanage your life, that doesn't control you, but you serve a God that gives you the freedom of choice, who gives you the freedom to love him, the freedom to serve him, the freedom to, to give to him, the freedom to, to live for him. He gives you that freedom. That is the beauty of our relationship with God, is that he will never force you to do anything that you don't want to do out of your own little heart. But he is someone that is already aware of what's inside that little heart. He's aware. You can't hide it from him. He's aware. He knows. And so Jesus said, fine, go. If you want to go, then go, guys, go. But I'm not going to dumb down the gospel for you. I'm not going to compromise this gospel for you. I'm not going to water down this gospel for you. I'm not going to change the message for you. I'm going to keep preaching the message that God gave me. He says, as a matter of fact, the things that I speak, I don't speak those things on my own. I only speak what the Father has shown me. Huh? Come on, Holy Ghost Presbyterian Church. 
<laughs> Matthew 5, look, verse 46 through 47. It says, what reward do you deserve if you only love the lovable? What reward is there if you only love the ones that are lovable? Look, don't even the tax collectors do that? How are you different? Ever say, how are you different? Don't forget that. How are you different? How are you different from others if you limit your kindness only to your friends? See, it's easy to win and to reach people that I already associate with. I can hang out with you guys. I can have like a real conversation. Like, hey, man, come on, man. You go to church with me? Like, we can have this conversation. I'm sorry. I just smacked you, didn't I? <laughs> My bad. It's that Jurassic Park movie, man. A little violent right now. It's easy to do that. But he says, but don't even the ungodly people do that? See, you got to ask yourself, when was the last time that you actually went out of your way, outside of your little bubble, outside of your little circle of friends, and you actually went out and reached someone that you don't know? See, so many times, and, and oh, I'm going to say it. Can I say it? Here's what Christians do a lot. We only go and minister to homeless people, drug addicts, alcoholics, or people that are in a very desperate situation. But we always forget the up and outers. You know why? Because you're too afraid to go talk to someone that already has money, that already has it all together. Why? Because you know what? My gospel doesn't work for that person. Well, let me tell you something. The poorest people are pl on planet earth are the people that are poor in spirit. The people that don't have God are the poorest of the poorest of the poorest. It's not the homeless person that's the poorest. It's the person that is poor in spirit that does not have jesus christ that is the most hurtful broken person on planet earth that needs someone to come and save them and guess what god gave us only one job jesus gave us only one job before he left and ascended back with the father he said to them go into all the world and make disciples baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Guess what? The first thing he said to them when he met them was, come, follow me. The last thing he said was, go and keep following me and win and make disciples, change lives, reach people. That is the only job that you and I have on this earth. If you're a Christian, how many Christians do I have in this room today? Lift your hand if you're a Christian in the air and then wave it like you care. Boom. Yeah. Yeah. Well, guess what? My question is, are you doing your job? Because you only got one. <laughs> you guys okay? Luke 19.10 says this. For the Son of Man came to what? And to save what? Yeah, he came to seek and to save those that are in the lost world. Well, isn't Jurassic Park, Jurassic Park, the lost world? Well, guess what? You help this lost world discover their Lord and Savior, the one who is king of their soul, the one who will help them enter into eternity. We are responsible for that. You know, yesterday I was at, um, uh, I went to a, a dealer, had my cars in the shop, so uh, the guy was in the vehicle and then we were driving in. And I just ran him and I said, hey, listen, um, I'm like, do you believe in God? And I know that was a very awkward question. I don't care. I just start questions like that. It doesn't matter to me. I'll eventually fix it all up and everything. But I'm like, hey, do you believe in God? I'm like, do you know that God loves you? And he, he looked at me like that. He's like, he's like, actually, he's like, you know what? I stopped going to church. I said, you did? I'm like, why'd you, why'd you stop going to church? He's like, Meg, I got a lot of work. I got work to do, man. I got, I got work. And I'm like, so honestly, how's that working out for you? And he said, no. He's like, I, I, I need to come back to God. You see, when Jesus said, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men, he wasn't saying, follow me and don't have a career. Follow me and don't buy a house. Follow me and don't drive a nice car. Follow me and never take a vacation. Follow me and whatever, whatever. He was saying, follow me and make me the center of everything you're going to be blessed with. In other words, make me the center of everything. If you want to be rich, then be rich. But there better be soul winning within that rich. Proverbs 11.30 says, and he who wins souls is wise. Are you wise? Get everything you want while you're on this earth because earth is short, but eternity is forever. 
but is he the centerpiece of your everything? Or is it all about you? Huh? How do you do that, Pastor? Well, yesterday, you know, we just moved into a new neighborhood. We sold our house, and now we're in this new community. And so now I'm, like, driving it every day. And you know what? I had, like, a bromance yesterday. You know what a bromance is? Is when you find another man that has the same, like, the likings. And it's just like, whoa, dude, where have you been all my life? When it was, I haven't talked to him yet. I haven't talked to the guy yet. He lives in my neighborhood. I'm driving my car. and, And, like, you know, just picture this. Everything went slow motion. And I was like... And you know the third look is you're it's serious. <laughs> he had like five motorcycles in his garage. And he was working on one of them. It's a race bike. And I was like, boom, boom, <laughs> boom, boom. <laughs> no, and I said to myself, you know what? I'm going to, I didn't have time yesterday. I, I honestly didn't because I know that if I get off, it's going to be, we're going to be on for a few hours probably talking. And so I said to myself, okay, Lord, I'm, this is going to be, this is going to be my, my mission here, Father. There's, there's an obvious reason the brother has bikes and I'm now living in the neighborhood. And so I'm, I'm telling myself, this will be the man I'm going to reach for Jesus Christ. Why? We have something in common. You know, it's as easy as finding people in your workplace that have something in common. Maybe you like some lady's shoes. You're like, oh my God, those shoes are cute. That's a common place. It's a common place of connection. Maybe you're a single mom and you meet another single mom. That's a common connection. Maybe you're a stay-at-home mom. Well, guess what? There's other stay-at-home moms. You're not the only one. It wasn't a secret. Every single person on this earth has some form of physical connection. Now we need to bring some spiritual vitality. And the only way you do that is that you must, you must look across the room at work. You must look across the street at home. You must look across the aisle at the store and you have to actually have a heart that's broken to save and seek those which are lost. Don't be the person that's so consumed with your studies just study, just study. I study the word. I read the word. I pray, I pray. But you never win a soul to Jesus Christ. That is wrong. I go to my, I have a small group. Great. I have my EMG group. Great. I go to Leadership Thursday. Awesome. But where in that is Jesus and you following? Where? Just tap your neighbor and say, Where? How far will you go to follow Jesus? So check this out. To end this message, so, G- so many left him, right? And then he stops and he turns to his core group. That's like me turning. How many have been with me here at Elevate Church? Let's say uh, two to four years. Have you been with me for two to four years? Lift your hand high in the air. Like, don't be ashamed of it. Okay, awesome. That's a lot of you. At the ADM, there's like pretty much everybody. Okay, put your hands out. Okay, so that's like me turning to you. And I say these words to you. So Jesus said to his 12... I said to the core of Elevate Church, and you, do you also want to leave? That was an awkward moment. That was awkward. I'm sure it was awkward for all. I'm like, is he serious? Like he's asking us, do we also want to leave? Jesus, listen, Jesus will confront you every Sunday. Jesus will confront you every Monday. Jesus will confront you Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and he'll ask you, and you, do you want to leave too? Do you want to go ahead? Am I offending you? Am I, am I having to bend the truth that you need to hear for you? And here's the truth, is that Jesus was basically telling, telling hey, listen, is this too much for you? Do you also want the free ticket as well? Is that why you want to, do you want to just be a fan of me feeding the thousands? Or do you want to follow me? And let's win the millions and billions of people. Let's win the Elevate Church that will be here 2,000 years from now. Huh? 
Let's win the person. Maybe you're sitting here today. You don't have a relationship with God. Man, you don't even know how you showed up at church today. But you're like, man, there must be something here. I like it. John 6, 68, Peter spoke up and he said, but Lord, where would we go? No one but you gives us revelation of eternal life. We're fully convinced that you are the anointed one, the son of the living God, and we believe in you. Listen, salvation is free, but following Jesus will cost you everything. Salvation is free, but following Jesus will cost you everything. Is it costing you right now to be a follower of Jesus? Does it cost you money? Does it cost you time? Does it cost you forgiveness? Does it cost you love? If it's not costing you that, then you're not following Jesus. Are you here, Elevate? If it's not costing you, you're not following salvation was free there was no work for your salvation it was free 99 but following jesus requires a cost <laughs> look at luke 9 23 then he said to them all whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves isn't it hard to deny your lust isn't it hard to deny your attitude it's so hard to deny this flesh, isn't it? That's what Jesus said. If you're going to follow me, you have to start learning how to deny yourself. Deny your opinion. Deny it already. Deny the fact that you're not committed. You know what I'm saying? Like, just deny. He says, deny that. Deny that. He says, you must deny themselves, and they must take up their cross every other week and follow me. Huh? I'm sorry. And they must take up their cross whenever they feel like it. No, they must take up their cross. I was wrong. On Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock. No. They must take up their cross Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and come back Sunday and give him glory for walking and carrying the cross with Jesus. Amen? That's what he said follow me but the only way to follow him is to deny me if i deny me then i'm following him if i am lusting after me then i have already denied him deny yourself <sighs> okay let me just end it here let's get out of here there's a story of a big zoo and uh, biggest zoo in the world. And they had this main attraction of a gorilla. But somehow the gorilla got away. How the heck do you lose a gorilla, right? And so the gorilla gets away. And now there's a challenge because you know what? It's costing them money. It's a big attraction. So what they end up doing is they start thinking, hey, we should probably get, uh, you know, someone to get in a costume suit, like a pretty legit looking gorilla suit and just have them play the gorilla. So they went for it. This dude likes like, hey, great idea. I'm count me in. So the guy was very animated, very, very illustrative, just like you know, having fun in there. And this thing blew up. It was bigger than the original gorilla. It got crazy big. People were coming from everywhere watching the gorilla that was animated because the other gorilla just sat there and did nothing. Just sucking his fingers and eating grass, and that's all the other gorilla did. This dude was on, man. He was like on fire. And so they were happy. Well. One day as the gorilla was sitting there in his cage and doing his thing, right, the man playing the gorilla, he looks over and he sees the fence on the side go down. And the lion walks into the gorilla campus, the gorilla ground. And the lion starts coming around the gorilla. And just deep, deep, deep growls. And the guy in the gorilla suit was like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Please don't eat me, lion. Please don't eat me, lion. Oh, my God. Please don't eat. Please, please, God, please, please don't eat me, lion. And the, the, the lion just kept growling. Arr! And it just kept going. And he's freaking out. So he starts like, please don't eat. And he starts getting like, <laughs> and the lion says from a deep voice, he says, hey, bro, shut up, bro. If not, we'll both lose our jobs. <laughs> What's the moral of the story? Stop trying to be someone you were never created to be and start being the son and daughter of God that you were always born to be and follow him 
and let's go and reach people in this lost world with the love of Jesus Christ because that's who you are. That's what you're called to be. That's who he made us to be. He didn't make us to be anything but that. Amen. Let's not, let's not be something. We know. Don't be a flexitarian. Be a follower of Jesus Christ. If you got anything out of this, give the Lord a big hand clap. Amen. Listen. This is where we come to truth. If you know that you have become a flexitarian, you haven't made it about people in a minute. Turn that phone off, please. And you know that it's time to change that. I can't keep being this comfortable person, Christian, just tasking off to Sunday church. No. I need to get a a revelation today and get some conviction back in my life. There's no shame in this. That's why we sang that, that hymn this morning. His, his mercies are fresh in you every morning. So aren't you glad that today you can get a reset inside with mercy and grace? The question is, is will you respond to the truth and say, no, I'm not leaving. I'm following. If today's message impacted you in any way, and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below, and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.